Ah, they've got to record it. Go ahead. Okay, welcome, welcome to the session on enhanced PKE and time lock puzzles. So I'm Stephen Galbraith, and I'm one of the co-chairs, and uh, Yongjun Zhao is the other co-chair. And Aaron, do you want to share your screen? You can you can start your talk on cryptographic assumptions and hidden order groups. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. So our work is called On Time Lock Cryptographic Assumptions in Abelian Hidden Order Groups, and it's a joint work with uh, uh, Mark Stevens. Um, so an abelian hidden order group is a finite abelian group such that it is hard to compute uh, a multiple of the order of the group. And preferably, we want to be able to sample such a group without the need for a trusted setup. Uh, some applications of hidden order groups are verifiable delay functions, cryptographic accumulators, and zero knowledge arguments. And perhaps the most well known examples of hidden order groups are RSA groups and imaginary quadratic class groups. Um, imaginary quadratic class groups have historically been less studied than RSA groups in cryptography, um, but they have the, the benefit of not needing a trusted setup, whereas RSA groups uh, do need a trusted setup. On the other hand, if we sample a random imaginary quadratic class group, um, it's not always going to be cyclic, and we have no efficient way to check if such a randomly sampled group uh, is cyclic. Um, so this motivates the need to study computational problems in abelian groups of hidden order and not just cyclic groups. Um, and then with respect to multiply, sample, multiple randomly sampled generators of the group. Um, and so the contributions of our work are to formalize and study this uh, abelian hidden order group setting. Um, and so we propose generalizations of the, the standard model, algebraic group model, and strong algebraic group model and we adapted the definitions of uh, cryptographic problems to suit this abelian hidden order group setting. Um, and the main changes here are that at the start of a computational game, um, a group is sampled randomly from some group family, and then n random elements are sampled to be used as generators. Um, and then at first we receive at the start of this game, uh, an explicit description of this group and this random set of generators as input. Um, in the algebraic group model, adversaries need to uh, additionally provide an algebraic representation of every output group element in terms of input group elements. And in the strong algebraic group model, adversaries need to expose the circuit of uh, elementary group operations, so multiplications and inversions that they use to compute output group elements from input group elements. Um, and then um, the main part of our work is to study relations between cryptographic problems in abelian groups of hidden order in these uh, three computational models. Um, so before giving an overview of the reductions that we've shown, let me briefly introduce the computational problems that we studied. So we studied various order problems of computing uh, either the group order or finding some element of low order. Then various root problems, where in the first we had to compute the root of uh, either a self-chosen challenge element or some random challenge element, um, to repeat the squaring problem, and uh, various generalizations of the discrete logarithm problem and uh, computational Diffie-Hellman problem to um, abelian groups. And so in this um, picture here, we see an overview of the reductions that we've shown in our work where the green cells indicate uh, new results. Um, and inside the cells, it shows the computational model in which we've uh, shown this result. The yellow cells indicate partial results, which are conditioned on some uh, extra conditions holding up. And the red cells indicate that no uh, generic reductions uh, can be shown uh, for these problems. Um, and so if we look a bit closer, the main chunk of new results that we've shown are reductions from this uh, MO problem, the problem of computing a multiple of the order to uh, all of the other computational problems that we study. And then composing these new reductions with uh, known reductions from the other problems to the multiple order problem, we obtain sort of this whole block of problems which are um, essentially equivalent to the problem of computing a multiple of the order uh, in these uh, respective computational models. And so, uh, and moreover, we show that 
uh, in cyclic groups of hidden order, we can obtain the exact order uh, of the group from a, from a D-log adversary, um, which is kind of a, a folklore reduction, which, which may be known before, I think. Um, but we uh, give some exact analysis of uh, success uh, probabilities and, and running time for this, uh, for this reduction. Um, so because most of the results we've shown are uh, reductions from this multiple order problem to some other computational problem, I want to briefly outline the, the, uh, what this reduction looked like. So the idea here is to obtain n linearly independent relations with respect to some system of generators of the group from an adversary solving uh, a given computational problem G. Um, and here with a relation, I mean some integer vector such that if you um, if you raise the generators to uh, the components of this vector, we uh, multiply and multiply them, we obtain the identity of the group. Um, and then if we succeed in doing this, the determinant of this system of relations is going to be a multiple of the group order. Um, so the challenges to show these reductions are, well, of course, to extract relations from an adversary solving uh, an instance of this computational problem, and then to randomize the instances of this problem and call the adversary multiple times, such that it um, succeeds with independent and identical success probability on each instance, um, such that it succeeds on n instances with sufficiently large probability, and such that n successfully extracted relations will be linearly independent with overwhelming probability. Um, and if you want to know more about the details of this reduction, I want to refer to the full first, full recorded version of our talk or to the full version of our paper, which is up on ePrint or you can find it in the conference proceedings. Um, and for now, I want to thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. That's a great, really nice talk, Aaron. And I just suddenly realized my fundamental mistake as I haven't pulled up the Zulip chat. Um, ah, is anyone, is anyone looking at that? Are there any, are there any questions on the Zulip? I can open it. No, there are not. Okay, good. Uh, has anyone in the room got a question? I um, actually have a question. I, okay, Kevin. You mentioned two examples of these hidden order groups, the class group and the integers modulo product of two primes. Are there yeah. other candidates that are known? Yeah, yeah. these um, uh, Jacobians. Of, um, right. If I said correctly, hyperliptic. Um, I think Stephen published a paper about this last yeah, year. Yeah, that's. That's that's a hilarious question, Kevin. That's like that's like I asked you to ask that question or something. <laughs> no, it's just my ignorance. I literally wrote Sorry. a paper on that recently. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, it's, 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 it's really it's a really interesting point. It's one of these. It's a it's a classic example of one of these things that happens in cryptography where we have actually a really small number of candidates for something that's actually quite interesting. Yeah. Um, Is that the only other candidate that you know of? Basically, uh, class, the class groups is the same. Yeah. Uh, I also had a, a question, Aaron. It was around um, you talk about the exact computing the group order exactly and the multiple yeah. computing the multiple order. Um, yeah. One of one of the things we have actually is estimates for the size of the group. So, I mean, the RSA case, you know, Z and star, the order is almost is very close to n. And, yeah. and for the class group, we have some kind of bounds related to this discriminant. So does yeah. that help in any way you to understand when you do, when you've actually finally got the exact order because you can use these bounds to help um, to know that you're finished? Um, yeah, maybe, but the difficult thing with these um, sort of things are, especially for, um, well, if you look at sort of the problems that also reduce to this multiple order problem, and the adversary, uh, then if we want to make a reduction from the multiple order to that uh, problem, then this adversary can just work in some strict sub lattice of the, of sort of the whole relationship lattice of the group. So it can always multiply the relations by some, some integer multiple. Um, and so we can always obtain um, sort of a, a larger multiple of the group order. And I think, well, the adversary could technically also do that such that it stays within these bounds but it's still a multiple of the group order. Um, but maybe, maybe if the bounds are tight enough, we could, could do yeah, something. Yeah, but it's probably a small, you could probably factor 
anyway, the time's up, so we better move yeah. on. To it. <laughs> yeah, so if you thanks. want to, if you want to yeah. stop sharing the screen, yeah, thanks for a really nice talk, Nick, Nicola. Uh, do you want to start setting up? Yep, thanks very much. Yeah, of course. Um, Share my screen. Cool, and uh, so so the next talk is on this. Uh, thing I find hard to pronounce, Astrolabos, something oh, yeah. like that. That's correct, yes. I'll let you introduce it. <laughs> so, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Nicolas Lambrou, and today I'm going to speak to you about Astrolabus, a universally composable time local encryption scheme. This work is a collaboration with Mirto Rapinis and Thomas Zaharias. So first, I'm going to give you a brief introduction into the concept of time local encryption. So what's time local encryption? Consider the case in voting where a voter encrypts the vote by using an encryption algorithm and a public key. The result is an encrypted vote. And then by revealing the secret key, everyone can retrieve the initial message. So, but what happens in the case that the secret key is not revealed? Uh, we have fairness issues because no one can reveal the initial message and specifically in self-styling protocols. So now consider the same case but instead of using a common encryption scheme, we're going to use time lock. And instead of a public key, we're going to use a time T. The result again is a ciphertext. And after T, time T has been reached, everyone can use the decryption algorithm provided with the time proof. A time proof is a proof that actually the time T has been reached and retrieve the initial message. So regarding the related work on that field, the existing times of uh, the, the existing construction of TLE they are based on arithmetics, for example, the repeating squaring, on hash function, repeating hashing, witness encryption uh, by using Boolean algebra, or centralized constructions, which mostly are based on public key infrastructure. Uh, and the generalization of all of this, if we provide a mechanism of verifying the the solution of uh, uh, the, the time proof that I referred earlier is the verifiable delayed functions. So regarding the security definitions, uh, all of the security definitions uh, in the literature are game-based and specifically they assume that the adversary operates in a concrete time. So we cannot argue, uh, we don't have composability arguments because time lock has not been studied in the UC framework uh, where the adversary operates in an asymptotic time. Uh, there is a work recently published in Eurocrypt. Uh, it's called TARDIS, a foundation of time lock puzzles in, in the UC framework. Uh, it has many similarities with ours, but despite that, there are also many difficulties, uh, many differences, I'm sorry. The first is regarding the modeling. In TARDIS, they assume uh, that a message can be retrieved after some computations have, has been done. In our case, a message can be retrieved when a specific time has been reached, where we believe that actually uh, captures more naturally the concept of time lock encryption. Uh, the second is regarding the generalization. In TARDIS, uh, they can only capture uh, time lock encryption schemes uh, based on computational puzzles. In our case, we can capture all of the mentioned constructions. The second is that uh, they cannot model an adversary that possess an advantage over the decryption time uh, over the honest parties. In our case, we capture such scenarios uh, by, by parameterizing our functionality by a leak function. And this is useful because there are constructions, for example, based on Bitcoin. And due to the selfish mining, the adversary possesses that advantage. And still, these constructions are useful. And the last is that the, the in TARTIS, the construction, they, uh, uh, the, the provided construction is, uh, it is based both on, on the random oracle and the generic group model. In our case, it is, been, it is based only on the random oracle. So regarding our research contribution, we define the concept uh, of time lock encryption in the UC framework by defining an ideal functionality, the FTLE. We capture privacy, a delay, where, uh, where actually uh, in the delay, we assume also that the encryption takes some time, uh, correctness, and finally, leak. Because as I mentioned, the adversary might possess an advantage in the decryption time over the honest parties. Uh, of course, ideally, the leak function should be equal to the identity, which means that the adversary doesn't possess any advantage. Uh, there, of course, there were challenges on defining a puzzle based on uh, a puzzle-based UCTLE protocol. The first is that all of all of the messages in the time in the concept of time lock encryption are, are eventually open. 
So uh, a simulator uh, must uh, encrypt a fake message, let's say, and after a specific time has been reached, uh, the simulator needs to equivocate that message and open it to a real one. So how is possible? The solution is to use no committing encryption uh, in the random oracle model. The second uh, problem is that uh, the, the TLE has a concrete nature, but we need to study in the UC framework where the model is asymptotic. So for that, the puzzle solving uh, should, should not be executed locally because else any puzzle could be just be uh, solved in just one round. So for that, we use the random oracle. And the second is that this access to this oracle should be restricted. For that, we introduce the functionality wrapper as in similar works. Uh, this is the extended construction of a time lock encryption. As you can see, the second argument, th this is where exactly the simulator can equi equivocate to the correct message because there is a call to the Adam Oracle. Uh, so uh, we linked uh, a TLE construction with, uh, with our UC definition by introducing a game based. Uh, this is actually called the Q security and informally states that it is hard to reverse a challenge message before the time comes. Uh, we don't capture, we only capture one wayness and no semantic security. But uh, with the equivocable extension that I referred earlier is enough for having a UC realization. So we have the next theorem that says that a TLE construction that satisfies Q security uh, actually can UC realize uh, our ideal functionality of TLE. So now I'm going to speak to you about Astrolabus. So Astrolabus actually combines two uh, very basic ideas uh, of uh, Mahmoud et al, and specifically uh, the, the puzzle that Mahmoud provides. But instead of spreading, of spreading the secret across all the puzzle, we just hide it in the last XOR operation of the random oracle call. Uh, and actually, the secret is a key, a key of a symmetric encryption, of symmetric encryption of, uh, of our message, uh, sim similar to the to the reverse at all construction. So combining these two ideas, the puzzle from Mahmoudi and the symmetric encryption that also reverse uses, we have Astrolabus. As you can see, it is in the random oracle model. It is public verifiable without any knowledge of any trapdoor information. And also the puzzle gen gen generation is efficient without require any knowledge of any trapdoor information because it can be parallelized and disproportional to the number of CPU cores in reality. In the UC framework, there's not CPU course. So uh, regarding the security of Astrolabus, Astrolabus satisfies the Q security. But the question is, is Q security enough in a standalone uh, setting? Uh, the, the, the answer is no, because uh, as I said, uh, it, it, there, there's no any it, it doesn't provide any semantic security guarantees, only uh, stresses the one wayness of the, of the construction. So for that, we extend it. Uh, our game-based definition, and we give it a, a neat CPA style fl flavor, uh, but in a, in a time-long setting. And Astrolabus also sat sa satisfies this. Uh, regarding our future research direction, so first is to improve the scalability of Astrolabus, because now the puzzle generation can be parallelized and it's proportional to the number of CPU cores, but unfortunately in practice, uh, still it's not very efficient in example, in application uh, like voting. So for that, instead of using a CPU, we can use a GPU where the, the number of cores are, are, are many more, uh, uh, but the architecture is totally different. So it needs pro proper benchmarking. And last uh, is to enhance, enhance Astrolabus and make memory hard in order to resist the hardware acceleration, uh, where help us to predict, let's say the correct parameters when setting the puzzle difficulty. Uh, we can use ideas from the balloon hashing paper uh, in order to predict the correct parameters, but still it needs uh, a proper benchmarking uh, because also the puzzle gen gen generation should be uh, ef should be efficient. Uh, these are the reference, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. It's very nice, quick summary of a quite complicated paper. Um, I don't see anything on the Zoom or on the chat. Has anyone got any questions at all? Yeah, so I guess my, my question was, uh, you, you touched on it right at the end about the, the, the fact that the person setting the puzzle or doing the encryption uh, can, can work in parallel, whereas the person who's solving the puzzle has to kind of compute these hashes in a serial way. Um, so, I mean, 
why didn't you do something referring referring to the previous talk why didn't you do something using like repeated squaring or these kind of things where, where uh, like the yes time so lock, like the reverse time lock thing so first of all uh in order to so in uh first of all in order to study uh, uh the reverse construction in the uc framework we uh, we were needed to work also in the generic group model so you know it it, it is let's say it's not bad but it, it's it's a uh, let's say uh a bigger assumption, you know, instead of having a construction that is based only in the in the Radom Oracle one, this is the first limitation. Uh, so yes, right. so I can see if you want to base it on hash functions, that's, that's exactly that's you know you only hash yeah. function, you know, without the general group model. And the second is that uh, because re because reverse has this problem of uh, setting the difficulty of the puzzle because they they have discovered many attacks due to the hardware acceleration. They there are more sophisticated algorithms that can actually solve. Uh, reversed, uh, you know, uh, doing the shortcuts and, and actually can solve reverse puzzle much faster. Uh, we believe that uh, uh, if we enhance uh, a hash function, it, it would be more easier than, than trying to enhance, let's say, the, the arithmetics and the algebra behind reverse uh, uh, construction. Okay. Cool. In right, we better move on to the next talk. Uh, we have to try and keep on time. So yeah, so, thanks very much, Niklaus, for your talk. Thank you. And do you want to stop sharing? And uh, um, I'll, I'll hand over to my co-chair to run the rest of it. Hi, everyone. This is Yongjun. and I'll be sharing the rest of the talks. So may we have our next speaker, Wang Yi, presenting the paper titled Identity-Based Encryption for Fair Anonymity Applications. Defining, implementing, and applying re-randomizable RCCA secure IDE. Okay. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes, sure. Hear me? Yes, uh, okay, thank you for introduction. Uh, welcome to this talk about identity-based encryption for fair anonymity applications, defining, implementing, and applying randomizable RCCA secure IDE. I'm Yi Wang, and this is a joint work with Rong Mao Chen, Xin Yi Huang, Jian Ting Ning, Bao Shen Wang, and Mo Tia. In this talk, we may consider the applications of fair anonymity. In a, in a scenario of anonymous communication, when someone abuses the anonymity services for illegal activities, we hope there is a trusted authority that can revoke the anonymity of malicious users. Obviously, identity-based encryption is a natural candidate for such a setting. In IBE, the key generation center can check any cipher test generated by the users and play the role of trusted authority. Apart from the fair anonymity, the other properties of such anonymous communication put some extra constraints on the underlying encryption scheme. First, the scheme should support the randomization of cipher tests so that the server can hide the connections of incoming and outgoing cipher tests. Second, the cipher test should be anonymous and do not reveal any information about the identity of receiver. Third, the encryption scheme should be secure against the active attacker who can probe the server with malicious cipher tests. The combination of those constraints points at randomizability, receiver anonymity, and RCC security. In particular, the RCC security is a meaningful relaxation of CC security for public key encryption, and it is compatible with randomizability. So we tend to study how to achieve those properties in the context of IBE simultaneously. Here are our main results. First, we define a new security notion called anonymous ID RCCA security. In fact, Gantry has defined the notion of anonymous ID CCA security already. It is a combination of receiver anonymity and ID CCA security. The only difference between anonymous ID CCA and ID RCCA security is the decryption oracle. Specifically, the decryption oracle of anonymous ID RCC security would output replay when the decryption result is equal to the challenge plan text M0 or M1. To build a randomizable IBE with anonymous ID RCC security, 
We start from the gantry IBE and consider its variant by modifying the vector beta into vector mu. Then we apply this variant to the double strand paradigm. The strand, the strand EID1 can be used to re-randomize both EIDM and itself correctly. However, this crypto system does not satisfy anonymous IDRCC security because the adversary in security game can guess the plain text and re-encrypt strand EIDM with it and verify the guess by queuing the decryption oracle. So we have to restrict the randomization of several test by perturbing the randomness in the first strand with extra Z0 and Z1. However, adversary is still able to randomize EIDM with public parameters, identity, and the plain text. So we mask the validity checking part with a secret value U and encapsulate U with another two strands. Now there is only one way to re-randomize the Zephyr test, and we can prove that this construction is anonymous IDRCC secure. Finally, we apply above IBE to build universal mixed net with fair anonymity. First, the trusted authority plays the role of key generation center and generates sacred keys for users and the mixed nodes. Then the senders generate packet by encrypting message with symmetric encryption and our IBE scheme and uploads packet to the bulletin board. Then the mixed node take turns to decrypt several tests symmetric cipher test and uh, randomize IBE cipher test in the packet. Finally, the receiver can decrypt the packet and retrieve the message. Compared with previous universal mixed net, our identity-based universal mixed net achieves fair anonymity and enjoys enjoy stronger unlinkability and provides more covert communication for the sender. Okay, that's all, thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, is there any questions from the audience? Um, if anyone has any questions, you can also raise it through the uh, Zulik link sent by Kevin. Can anyone hear me? Can anyone hear me? Yes, I can, I can hear you. OK, maybe one quick question. Um, so in your security game, uh, does the adversary get to choose the um, IDs and the message uh, before having access to the decryption oracles? Yes. So in this sense, is it selectively secure? Uh, it is. Uh, yeah, this is stronger than selective secure. secure. The adversary can access the key generation, key, key generation oracle. And because the uh, yeah. identity, identity under the plan text is, the, is provided by the adversary and not by the challenger. Okay, I see. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, we are... Okay, let's uh, invite our next speaker. So we'll have our yeah, fourth talk, simulation based by selective opening security for public key encryption. It will be presented by Yang Rupeng. Yes, please go hey. ahead. Hey, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm Rupin Yang, and uh, today I'm going to talk about how to define and construct a PKE scheme with by selective open security. This is based on joint work with Jin Zolai, Zhang Huang, and Jian Wen. So a PKE scheme consists of three algorithms, namely the generation algorithm, which produces a pair of public key and secret key, the encryption algorithm, which encrypts a message with a public key, and the decryption algorithm, which decreases some text to record the message with a secret key. Its correctness requires that the decryption algorithm can always recover the correct message from an uh, honestly generated uh, subtext. And its security requires that the author can learn any information about the message from the subtext. 
this can be defined by requiring that the, those threads will mm -hmm. have be simulated by civil. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, is there any problem? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess you can proceed. You can you can just go ahead. Okay. Uh, so this can be defined by requiring that the but those threads uh, will can be simulated by a simulator that takes nothing as input. Okay, so a PK scheme is usually deployed in the machine setting. That is, there are many senders and many receivers. Uh, each receiver has her own public key and secret key, and the sender sends the message to the receiver by encrypting the message with the receiver's uh, public key. So in this case, it's common that some senders and the receivers may be corrupted and the adversary can learn their internal states. In this case, it seems infeasible to practical messages that are sent by a corrupted sender and messages that are received by a corrupted receiver. However, we still hope to protect messages that are transmitted between uncorrupted users, especially when the corrupted messages and the uncorrupted messages may be related. A PK scheme with this strong security is designed to have select security. And in the literature, we have formally started the sender select token security, where only the senders can be corrupted, and the receiver select token security, where only the receivers can be corrupted. However, we have not formally started how to define and construct PKE schemes with by select open security, where both the senders and the receivers can be corrupted. So in this work, we formally initiate the study of by selective open security for PKE schemes, and our results include four parts. Uh, first, we give a formal definition of bus selective open, selective open security for PKE schemes. The definition follows previous simulation-based definitions of sender selective open security and that of uh, receiver selective open security, except that the author in this new definition can corrupt the senders and the, rece the receivers simultaneously. Uh, we then give a construction of PK scheme uh, with by selective open security in the red oracle model. Uh, <clears throat> uh, in particular, we show that the simple construction of PK scheme from a key encapsulation mechanism and the quantum pad is already by selective open secure. If we derive the masking key of the quantum pad from the encapsulated key of the camp scheme, we are around Morocco. We also consider a weak notion of bus selective open security. Uh, that is, the adversary has to choose its uh, attacking type uh, after seeing the public keys. The definition is uh, weaker than the standard bus selective open security, but it is still strictly stronger than the sender selective open security and the receiver selective open security. Actually, it implies the requirement that a PK scheme has both the sender selective security and the receiver selective open security. Okay, so finally, we give a construction of PK scheme with weak bar selective open security. Uh, to achieve this goal, we present a new primitive called KEQCOBOL Hash Boost Server and instantiate it from either the DDH assumption or the DCR assumption. We then give a general construction of PK scheme with weak bus selective open security from this new primitive. Okay, so for time reason, we are not able to cover all details of our results. Uh, if you are interested, please uh, watch the on YouTube or read our book paper for more details. That's all, thanks for your attention and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Rupon, very nice talk. Um, any questions from the audience? The Zulik chat is also quite quiet. Um, okay, I have one question for you, Yurupang. Yeah. Um, in your security definition, you follow the simulation-based paradigm. I'm wondering if it is possible to define an IND-based security notion for this bidirectional uh, selective opening. Uh, yes, uh, it, uh, uh, we can uh, define the bus selective open security for uh, either def either IND based setting, but uh, there are some restrictions in the definition uh, in the sender uh, selective open security 
uh, I'm going to do serial selection and separate case. Uh, so uh, the restriction is that we have to restrict the mass distribution uh, submitted by the author. That is, in the simulation based uh, definition, we don't have to restrict the message distribution submitted by the author. But if you consider the int based, you have to uh, give some uh, artificial uh, restriction on the message distribution. So the uh, personally, the, I think the int based definition is a bit uh, artificial, and uh, we prefer to have a simulation based one. And uh, also, uh, a simulation based security is uh, should be stronger than the int based uh, security. Uh, so that's a strong uh, that's a stronger definition, and uh, it, it seems more meaningful to construct P, uh, PK scheme with a stronger security. Well, can you formally prove that the simulation based is uh, strictly stronger than the IND based? Uh, Have you tried to exploit that? Uh, I'm not sure if a, a formal a formal uh, reduction exists. Uh, actually, it depends on the uh, type of the, the definition. Uh, so, in some cases, uh, the, uh, the the simulation based uh, definition can't imply the IND based definition because the adversaries need the two definitions has different powers. But uh, uh, actually, uh, if we have some uh, detailed definition, it is possible to prove that. I think. Uh, okay, great answer. Thank you very much. Yeah. Any questions from others? Well, if no, then let's thank Rukong again and welcome our next speaker. Okay, shall we have uh, Han Shui? Yes, yes. Presenting the yeah, presenting the cam with tight enhanced security in the multi-user setting, impossibility results, and optimal tightness. Yeah. Yeah. Please go ahead. Okay. Thanks for the introduction. Hi, everyone. I'm Shui Han. This is a joint work with Sheng Liu and Da Wu Gu. Let me directly start with the general overview of key encapsulation mechanism. We consider two users, Alice and Bob. Alice generates her public key and secret key. And with the public key of Alice, Bob can produce an encapsulated key K and a ciphertext C. Then Alice can use the secret keys to recover the encapsulated key from C. This way, Alice and Bob establish a shared encapsulated key. CAM has many applications, for example, in constructing public encrypt encryption, authenticated key exchange protocols, etc. In real-world scenarios, there might be many users. Each of them generates their own keys and each two of them might communicate and send many ciphertexts to each other. This is a so-called multi-user setting. In this setting, an adversary is able to see all users' public keys and all ciphertexts sending over the public channels. Moreover, a powerful adversary may even craft some users and obtain their secret keys, SK1, SK2, and may obtain some keys encapsulated in some ciphertexts like the, like the K1 and K2. The security of CAM asks the, un the unreviewed key, the unreviewed encapsulated key under uncrafted users to be pseudorandom. Such a strong yet realistic security is formalized and enhances security in our work. To prove the security of CAM, a common way is using a security reduction, which turns any adversary A breaking CAM's security into an adversary B, solving some hard problem. And if the security loss factor L of the reduction is a constant, then we call CAM has a tight security. It is desirable to have tightly secure CAM. However, starting from the seminal work by Cora, Bajar et al. at EuroCrypt 16 showed that tight security under adaptive corruptions is impossible to achieve if either secret key has the key uniqueness property or secret key has key re-randomization property. And by the existing impossibility results, uh, this rules out some camps on their tight, uh, tight security under corruptions, like the L gamma camp. However, many well-known camps, including the Kramer-Schuf and Kurosawa decimate camp, 
their secret key has neither key uniqueness nor key re-randomization. So determ determining whether tightness in possibility holds for such CAM schemes needs new techniques. And in our work, we introduced a new technical tool called CAMS rank. First, we study the equivalence of secret keys when they are used, use, they are used to de decapsulate a set of ciphertexts X. For a pair SK and SK prime, they are decap equivalent with respect to the set X. If for every ciphertext in X, the decapsulation using SK equals the decapsulation using SK prime. With this relation, we can partition the secret key space into many equivalent classes. In particular, for an element C1 in X, if X defines more equivalent classes than X set minus C1, then we call this element C1 is an independent element in X. Otherwise, that X defines exactly the same relation with X set minus C1, they then we call C1 is a dependent element in X. So starting for, from any ciphertext set X, we can drop all dependent elements without changing the equivalence relation it's defined. And in the end, every, every element left are independent ones. And we call the resulting subset X prime of X an independent set. So for set X, it may have many independent sets. It may have, have many independent subsets X prime, and we define the rank of X and the size of the largest independent set of X. Um, by taking X as the whole ciphertext space, we define the rank of Kim, and it also equals the size of the largest independent set of ciphertext space. With the notion of rank, we established our new impossibility results by mental reduction. Namely, as long as CAM has a polynomial rank, then it is impossible to achieve a tight enhanced security. And the security loss is as at least linear in the number n of users. Then we apply our, our impossibility results to many well-known CAMs by showing that their rank is polynomially bounded. For example, the rank of the cram CAM is two, and the rank of Kurosawa decimate cam is no more than four. Therefore, the enhanced security of these schemes inherently suffer from a linear security loss when reducing to non-interactive assumptions. From a positive side, we also show that this linear security loss is achievable by giving two reductions. And this together with our impossibility results show that for cams with polynomial rank, the linear security loss factor for enhanced security is optimal. To summarize, in our work, we define the realistic enhanced security for CAM, and we develop a new technical tool called CAM's rank to identify a class of CAM schemes for which impossibility of tight reduction holds. And finally, we show the linear security loss is achievable and optimal for CAMs with polynomial rank. For more details, please have a look at the longer video and our paper on ePrint. Thank you for listening, that's it. Thank you very much, Han Shai. A very nice talk. Any Thank questions you. from the audience? You can just unmute yourself and ask questions. Well, the Zulip chat. Yeah, I actually, uh, I actually have a question. Um, so, can you give any kind of intuition as mm -hmm. to? Well, I mean, my understanding of the rank is it's something to do with equivalent private keys. I don't yes. really yeah. understand any kind of intuition why the number of private keys should have an influence over the multi-user security of a of a cam. Do you do you have like a like any kind of simple thought way to think about that? Um, because uh, we we prove the impossible results by the mental reduction, and we define we propose a. Uh, Specific adversary A star. A star can utilize uh, this this property to um, to to if to bounce the security loss. And the, uh, in particular, the adversary will randomly choose one of the Q ciphertexts to to change uh, uh, ciphertexts. One of the Q change ciphertexts. And uh, the, the probability that the chosen ciphertext is a dependent one. 
by our notion came of rank is uh, bounded by uh, the number the rank of came over the total number of q. So if the the rank is a polynomial, then we can always choose the number of ciphertext q to a larger polynomial. So that's uh, this uh, so that's this uh, quotient is uh, sufficient small. I guess maybe I was thinking almost of the, of the other way around. Um, yeah. I mean, it seems it, it seems like um, if you have if you have lots of different secret keys, mm -hmm. um, I mean that that almost seems worse, right? I mean, if 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 I have if I have lots of public keys and it turns out that lots of people's secret keys can decrypt a ciphertext, to me that feels like a weaker a weaker system. But you're you're saying there's actually strength. It's saying somehow it gets stronger by having more secret keys or something. I'm not sure I understand. Uh, yes. <laughs> no. Uh, it's, so it's okay. Um, I should just read your paper. <laughs> I think I agree that it's counterintuitive, though. Great discussion. Um, any more questions from the audience? We still have one or two minutes. Uh, let me raise a naive question. Um, you prove you you show that you can apply your lower bound to many existing CAM mechanisms, right? Yes. So I'm wondering whether the existing proofs of the security of these CAMs actually meet your lower bound. Uh, originally, these CAMs are proved in a week uh, in a. Uh, weaker model than we considered in our paper. In our paper, we consider a, a, a strong security model. So in the strong security model, uh, they cannot achieve a tight security reduction. And for some of them, we proved that, for example, the L gamma came and the, Hoff, the came proposed by Hoffens and Yager, they can achieve this lower bound. And the, this is an optim, optimal security loss. But the other camps, we don't know whether they can meet this lower bound, right? Am I understanding correctly? Yeah, yes, yes. Okay, I see. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if uh, no more questions, then let's thank uh, Hanshai again and welcome our last speaker in the section. Yeah, Chen Yu, please go ahead. Ah, wait a minute. Yeah, um, our last talk will be hierarchical integrated signatures and encryption presented by Chen Yu. Uh, yes, per minute. Can you share your screen? Yeah, yeah. And uh... oh. Are we, do we have lost Shen Yu? I couldn't see him in the chat room. Uh, yeah. Can, can you see my slides? Yes, yes, please uh, make it full screen. Okay, wait a minute. Okay. Can you see the slides now? Yes. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, thanks for the introduction. And uh, hi, I'm very happy to present our paper entitled Hierarchy Integrated Signature and Encryption. This is a joint work with Changtang and Yu Wang. Uh, as everybody know, public encryption and signature are workhorse primitives that are typically used simultaneously to secure communication. But a subtle point is that when we use public key encryption and signature together, we need to concede joint security. That is, the EFCMA security for the signature component should hold even in the presence of an additional decryption oracle, while the INTCC security for the public encryption should hold even in the presence of a signing oracle. Well, basically, there are two principles when using public key encryption and signature together. That is, key separation and key reuse. 
the key separation protocol, uh, the key separation principle is using independent independent key pairs for signature and public encryption. The advantage of key reuse is that the joint security is immediate and the construction is off the self. And it also naturally admits individual key SQL, which is a vital property to achieve a balance between user authenticity requirement and the society auditing requirement. The disadvantage of key separation, key separation is the key measurement complexity get doubled and also the certificate cost. It also complicate, complicated the design of high level protocols. While the key reuse principle is using the same key pair for both signature and encryption, we refer to such a scheme as the integrity of the signature and the encryption called ISE for short. The advantage of key reuse principle is it reduces the key measurement complexity as well as the certificate cost. It also helps to simplify the design of high level protocol. But the disadvantage of key reuse is the joint security is not immediate and it does not naturally admit individual key escrow. Well, as discussed above, we are facing a dilemma between key reuse that brings performance benefit and key separations that supports individual key escrow. An interesting question is, can we enable individual key escrow mechanism while retaining the merits of key reuse? To address this problem, we propose a new cryptographic primitive called hierarchy integrity signature and encryption. In HRC, a single public key serves as both verification and encryption key. While there is a hierarchy between signing key and decryption key, the signing key SK serves as a master secret key and can derive a decryption key used only for decryption in a one-way manner. As to security, we require strong joint security. We require the INDC secu CCA security for the PK component remains even in the presence of a signing oracle, while the EF CMA security for the signature component remains even the adversary get to see the whole decryption key rather than merely access to a decryption oracle. Next, we present two generic construction of HIC. Our first uh, HIC construction is from identity-based encryption. The main idea is to apply the null transform and the CHK transform to one identity-based encryption simultaneously. Where well, a technical hurdle is that the decryption key for the identity space I1 should be short. That means we need a succinct representation for all secret keys for identities in the in I1 space. To solve this problem, we propose a new cryptographic primitive called constraint IB for prefix predicates, which in turn can be built from bin binary tree encryption. Well, our second generic construction of HIC is from PKE and IZKPOK. The idea is to create a hierarchy key structure by one-way function. Uh, we first pick a random bit string as a signing key, then maps SK to random SRA, and uh, then runs the public key encryption key generation algorithm with random SRA to generate the public key and the decryption key. Whereas well, the encryption component of HIC is simple, which is the same as the underlying public encryption. To correct a signature, we use general purpose public coin ZKPOK to prove knowledge of SK with respect to the public key. Next, we describe an important extension of HIEC with global SQL property. Nowadays, large scale collaborative working apps like us, such as Slack is getting popular. On one hand, the employee may have the right to get access to all private communication for various reasons. On the other hand, employees need to be assured that even a malicious employer cannot slam them by forging a signature for fabricated communications. We thus further expect a global SQL property. That, that means there is a super key that can decrypt any subtext on the, any public key, while the signature remains secure even in the presence of a such super key. To attain global SQL property for HIC in a generic manner, 
we first take a tour to revisit the global SQL public encryption. We formalize the definition of security notions for global SQL public encryption and uh, give two generic constructions. Our first generic construction is from is from any public encryption and ISK. It could be viewed as a new application of the celebrated Noyan transform beyond the CCS security. Our second generic construction is from any three-party non-intuitive key exchange. The idea is that uh, let the escrow center generate a key pair himself to send a plain text to a receiver with public key beta. Uh, the sender first generate a temporary key pair, PK alpha, SK alpha, then compute the shared key among PK alpha, PK beta, PK gamma by running a three-party IKE in his head. The rest of the construction is simple. Combine previous result, we obtain a technology roadmap of global SQL HIC. We can freely take any phase from the leaf node to the root node to construct a global SQL HIC. At last, we make a comparison between CP, CPK, IAC, and global SQL, global SQL HIC. From this table, we can see that the global SQL HIC not only enjoys the benefit of key reuse, but also support richer functionality, such as individual and global key escrow. The, experiments, the experimental results demonstrate our global SQL HIC schemes have comparable efficiency with the most efficient combined public key scheme and enjoy compact key size as well. As a byproduct, we also obtain the most efficient global SQL public encryption to date which beat the best previous scheme with 20 to 13 times speed up. Well, let's summarize our talk. In this work, we propose a new notion called HICE. Our notion hit a sweet balance and thus reconcile the apparent conflict between key separation and key reuse. It can be used as a drop-in replacement of PKE plus signature in any scenarios that require authenticity, confidentiality, and auditability simultaneously, and both user and authority will have incentives to deploy. We also extensively revisit the global SQL public encryption. Our result indicated a new application of Noyan transform and established a novel connection from three party on IKE. That's all. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Chen Yu, for your great talk. Any questions from the audience? Um, if no, then uh, let me ask one question. Uh, hi, Chen Yu. You define your HISE in a way that uh, the signing key can derive the, uh, the, 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 the decryption key. Is it possible yeah. to define the other way around, namely the decryption key derives the signing key in a one uh, way? Manner? Yes. Yes, thanks for this question. We indeed concede this theory notion at the end of a paper. Uh, that is, the uh, decryption serves as a master secret key while it can derive a uh, signing key in a one way manner. The notion could be useful in applications where uh, the privacy of messages of utmost importance while the signing capability needs to be delegated. Yes. But why do you choose this particular direction first instead of the other? Uh, because for the time being, I we found it hard to find uh, uh, good applications for the new for the during notion. But uh, this notion uh, that is the signing case of utmost uh, importance ha is uh, has found uh, widely usage. For example, in the cryptocurrency. Because in most applications, the the signing capability is also uh, is always of the first priority should be protected. Uh, okay, thank you very much for your explanation. Okay, thanks. Um, well, if no questions from the audience, then uh, we'll call it a day. And thank you very much for joining this section. Thank you, Steve, for co-chairing the session with me. 
thanks for all the authors. Yeah, thanks for all the authors. Have a nice day. Great. Bye. What do we now do now, Kevin? Does